Let me talk about first about uh, education. Um, education should change dramatically, dramatically. Again, the goal is to have the average person, not the top person, not the most brilliant students, the average person to come up with ideas. Okay. Um, now, <clears throat> we should do this revolution, this education uh, revolution, uh, changing fundamentally the way we think about education. Okay. Now, uh, one of the basic tenants of the current education system, which, by the way, has not changed for, uh, for 300 years, is that the teacher knows stuff, the student doesn't know stuff, and what uh, the education process is, is that uh, these things that the teacher knows are transmitted to the student. Well, for the first time in history, for the first time in history, we are in a world in which the student knows more than the teacher in very important ways. For example, technology. Right? Picture what would happen in any classroom in this country or in the rest of Europe or in the United States. What happens in every classroom when the computer breaks? Who is the least qualified person in the room <laughs> to solve the problem? Right? Every classroom has a computer now. What happens when it breaks? So, you know, the problem is that the students know that. The students know that. The students know more than their parents in very important ways. Right? What happens in your house when the new cellular phone arrives or when the new computer arrives? What do we all do? We tell our kids, right? Do it. <laughs> now, if we try to do it, if we try to do it, we, we uh, we, 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 we look for the in, in strong, in, in, instructions book, right? Cable, yellow cable, orange cable. By the time we get to the green cable, the kid is, is, is finished <laughs> without instructions, right? Because they live in a world without, we, we, live in, we, we come from a world of instructions. They live, in a, they live in a world, they have always lived in a world of trial and error, right? Of menus, investigating. This doesn't work. It's not here. It's there. Boom. And they always find a solution. Try and error. We, we, we follow instructions. This is, they live in a different planet. Last Christmas, I, I gave a book to one of my nephews. You know, a very young nephew. You know what he did? He opened the book, and he started pushing the words. <laughs> and nothing happened. And say, well, this is useless, he, right? We live in the world of books. And books were the most efficient way to transmit information in the past, when there was nothing else, right? But now, you need things to happen when you push them, when you push words. You push words, Wikipedia shows up, or a video shows up, or a definition shows up, right? Uh, now, we insist on teaching our kids using these old technology that we call books. I'm not saying the kids should be reading books. Books. They should be. Re they, they, I'm sorry. I, I'm not saying that kids shouldn't be reading. I'm saying that perhaps the best way to convey the same information is not through books. It's through the new technologies. But we live in. We we come from from the old world, and we haven't changed. When I when I was a kid, my my parents, my father, forced me to read one very important book in in, in Spanish called the Quixote. A huge book. And when I saw that thing, I said, Daddy, this is, this is very large. Uh, uh, it's going to take me three months to read this. And I, and I asked him, do you know how many, how many movies I could watch uh, during this period that I'm going to spend? You know, do you know the amount of information I could gather by, by going to the movies instead of reading books? And he said, read books. And I, and I read the Quixote. And you know what? I read the Quixote. And you know, do you know the Quixote? So the Quixote was somebody that was crazy. And they said, Daddy, I read the Quixote, and the guy is crazy. And do you know why he's crazy? Because he reads books. <laughs> and, and, this, and this makes sense, actually. 
it, it, is, it is picture picture a scene of somebody reading a book in 1605, which is when the Quixote was written. Most people didn't understand this thing that we call books, right? And if you don't know what a book is, and you see somebody looking at a piece of paper for hours and hours, you would think this person is crazy, right? Because, because the illiterate population, in other words, the majority of the population at the time, they didn't really understand. And because they didn't really understand, they thought uh, Quixote was crazy. Well, that same look is the look I had when I was watching TV as a kid. And my father thought I was crazy. That's why he forced me to read books. And that same look is the look that now we see in our children, not not when they watch TV, but when they are on the PlayStation. And we make the same mistake. You stop, stop the PlayStation. Let me introduce Ares. RS is a uh, assembling reconfigurable and luminous surgical system. This is um, a, a new uh, surgical procedure for cancer. This is for uh, um, stomach cancer. Uh, this is like a pill, right? A pill that uh, you program. It's like a little pill you program. Um, uh, you scan the body of the patient. Right? And with a computer, you program the pill going from, uh, from your mouth all the way to the stomach. Uh, it uh, it uh, proceeds with the surgery, it gets the tumor, and then uh, uh, inside it, w w when it's inside the stomach, it, it reconfigures itself into this uh, animal, uh, into this animal with, uh, with, uh, with uh, three heads and three, and, uh, and three arms. It cuts the tumor, it puts inside the pill, and then uh, it comes out. Okay, now uh, ask yourself what is, who are, who is going to be, or who are going to be the best surgeons of the future? The kids that didn't listen, the kids that didn't read the Quixote, the kids that, have, have you seen these, peop these, these people's fingers, how fast they move? Well, we don't understand, we live in another planet, we think they are crazy. But this dexterity actually uh, will be important in, in their lives in the future. Uh, I'm not saying that we should all run and tell our children to, uh, to uh, you know, you know, play in the PlayStation for eight hours. What I'm saying is that we should understand that they live in a different world and the education system should adapt to this new world and it's not adapting to this new world. The education system is still with the old books, with the old teachers. Um, now, the education system, the education system uh, should change in other ways. And the most important goal should be not to encourage curiosity, but at the very least, not to kill curiosity. Right? Curiosity is the key ingredient to come up with ideas. Now, the majority of education systems in the world end up killing the natural curiosity that children have. At age three, four, five, children are very curious. At age 20, 21, 22, when they leave college, most of that curiosity is gone. We killed it. We don't encourage, for example, to ask questions. But of course, if you don't ask questions, you cannot get answers. An idea has two parts. First you ask, then you answer. Some, you have to realize something is broken, something doesn't exist. Something could be done better. Something is wrong, right? If you don't understand that something is wrong, something can be done better, something is broken, you're not going to solve it. So before answering, you need to ask questions. Are we teaching our kids to ask questions? Now, in, in most systems, what we do is actually kill. If a student has a natural tendency to ask questions in class, or investigate with the teacher if the teacher tells the student the truth. And the student naturally investigates whether that's the truth or it's not the truth. And finds that there are other truths. So there are other people that see that truth in a different way. And the student dares to put that in the exam. Oh, the teacher says, A, hey, but I did my investigations and A is wrong. What's going to happen to that kid? He's going to fail, right? The kids know perfectly how how to answer exams. Sometimes they know that what they're answering is not true, but they know what to answer in order to please the teacher. And that's a killing curiosity. For example, math. We all know that math is good, 
But are we teaching the right math? Remember math? Most of the math we learned in school, most of it was calculus. Now, for those of you who don't remember what calculus is, calculus is that when, when you have train A leaving station one at this speed, uh, and train B leaves the other station another speed, at, have you ever encountered that problem in your life? <laughs> How many times did you have to solve these in, in class? Every year you had this train problem, <laughs> right? Now, of course, our world is full of math. But what kind of maths? It's usually statistics, right? It's data. It's graphs. It's probabilities. It's averages, right? But the statistics class is always the last class of the math semester, right? The last class. And it's usually that stupid lesson about a bag full of blue balls and yellow balls and what is the probability, right? <laughs> That's the statistics we, we, we teach. Right? Math is really important, but are we teaching the kind of math that will be useful for kids to come up with ideas and implement ideas? Wasting talent. That's the most important aspect of the education. What we should really, really make sure we don't do is kill our students' talent. But that's what we do all the time. There's a very interesting study In 1985, a, a Canadian sociologist discovered that uh, the uh, hockey, the national team, uh, the, 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 the hockey national team of, of Canada, the team going to the Olympics, all of the players had been born in January, February, or March. And then he did, you know, he investigated. And he found that the overwhelming majority of the players of the National Hockey League were born in the first half of the year. And then many researchers started looking at other sports. Immediately, people looked at football. And the majority of top players in the world are born in the first half of the year. By the way, Pep Guardiola was born in January and Messi in June. <laughs> Actually, if you look, you can go now to the, to the website of the, of the, of the uh, UEFA. You know, the best, the, 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 the best players, the best 11 players that have been voted, best 11 players in the world in 2011. Of the 11 players, 10 are born in the first six months of the year. Only Thiago Silva is not born in the first half of the year, but he was born on July 16th. <laughs> and this has been found over and over again in every sport. And of course, the imme in immediate reaction to this is, um, well, it is, uh, it is uh, astrology, right? <laughs> February is the month of, uh, of the uh, gods of the war, wars and sports. Uh, it must be that. No, it's not that, of course. What happens is the answer is super easy, right? What happens is that when kids uh, are young, uh, they compete, we put them in teams, and we separate them by age. The six-year-olds play together, the seven-year-olds play together, the eight-year-olds play together. But of course, the six-year-olds are, uh, you know, they have people born in January and they have people born in December. And of course, the January kids are way bigger than the December kids. They are essentially one year older. And because the coaches want to win, what they do is they give more time to the better players, which happen to be the bigger, faster, uh, smarter players, who happen to be the slightly older kids, who happen to be those born in the first three months of the year. Now, in the following year, those kids that happen to be bigger have, are still bigger, and they now have an additional advantage, experience. And therefore, they play even more. And then the following year, they have an even, an even bigger advantage. And the advantage gets bigger and bigger and bigger. 
And of course, there is a time in life when the physical differences disappear, right? At age 20, if you're born in December or January, it doesn't really matter, you are just as big, uh, just as fast, uh, just as strong as uh, everybody else, right? But the experience remains. Now, this led Malcolm Gladwell to uh, develop his theory of uh, 10,000 hours. If you want to be good at something, you have to work for 10,000 hours. The only reason why the Beatles were so good is that they had practiced for 10,000 hours at a bar in Germany for five years before becoming the Beatles. The only reason why Bill Gates was so good was that he actually programmed for years and years when he was in, uh, in high school and he programmed for 10,000 years. The only reason why these players are good is that they play for 10,000 hours, right? And, that's, uh, and that is, which by the way, this means, this means that if you want to be uh, good at something, you need to work for 10,000 hours at something, but it also means that uh, you're not gonna be good at anything unless you like it. So when your students or when your children or when your friends ask you, what should I do? Should I study accounting or something else? The answer should be, you should study whatever you like. Because if you do something that you don't like, you will never be good at it because you're never gonna spend 10,000 hours. It is impossible to spend 10,000 hours at something that you don't like, right? And that's the main lesson Malcolm, Malcolm Gladwell gets from this. I get a different lesson, which by the way, by the way, now there are studies uh, that go beyond uh, sports. Uh, this is uh, true that, now this is also true for academic achievement, okay? Academic achievement is a little bit different because uh, unlike sports where all, all, the, the, all the countries have the same cutoff, uh, academics, uh, are, you know, the children are broken uh, into different classes, uh, you know, depending on different months in different countries, right? Uh, in some countries, uh, the, the oldest guys in the class are the, the guys born in August, uh, sometimes in June, sometimes September. But if you do this correctly, academic achievement is also related to the month of the year in which you were born. And younger kids in classes uh, tend to have lower grades. And the same thing is true for income, the same thing is true for leadership positions, and it's true for uh, CEOs in, uh, in the, in the uh, Standard & Poor's 500. The time of the year in which you were born actually matters. Which leads me to one, one very important question. And that's the, the last thing I want to mention today. One very important question, and that is, where are the December kids? <laughs> don't, no, don't, don't laugh, this is really important. This means that there are thousands and thousands of children with talent, because the innate talent of the December kids is the same as the talent of the, of the January kids, right? But because we, without realizing, no, nobody thought of this before, but without realizing, we just separate kids by age, we immediately destroy the talent of all the December kids. How many kids born in December could have been great football players playing for FC Barcelona, and now they are not playing because they were born on the wrong month of the year? How many kids could have been great scientists, doctors, but because they were born in the wrong month of the year, we didn't give them enough time, we didn't give them enough opportunities, and now their talent is wasted. Right? The problem is that our education system is essentially a, a McDonaldization of children, right? Everybody should be the same. But now we, we can do it differently. We have the technologies, right? We can, we can, we can iPadize the children, right? iPad means that you can, you, can, uh, you, you, you can build your own newspaper. Right? You can get the economic news from this place, the sports news from this other place. You can build your own book in your iPad. Well, the same thing we should do with our children. And this is, this, because we are not doing this, this is the real crisis. Environmentalists usually ask the question, what planet are we leaving to our children? That's the wrong question. The question is, what children are we leaving to our planet? Thank you very much.